Welcome to the John Gets Games Impressions Vlog, where today I'll be covering four games that I was able to play recently. Now, I would like to mention that if you would prefer to listen to this vlog instead of watch it, then you can do so by searching for the John Gets Games podcast wherever you normally listen to podcasts. I'd also like to ask that if you end up enjoying this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. On top of that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. There you'll find a bunch of ways that you can really help things out, and some of them come with cool bonuses like voting on a few of the videos that I film each month. All right, let's now start talking about games, and the first one today is Castell. Now, this is not actually a new game. This one was published, I believe, in 2018, and I recently was able to finally play a full game of it. Now, I say full game because technically, a couple of years ago, I did play about one third of a game, but then we got kicked out of the play space, and we weren't actually able to finish that game. Now, uh, recently, a friend of mine was interested in playing it, and there is a mod for it on Tabletop Simulator, so he taught it to me and two of our other friends, so we got to play a full four player game. Let's start this off with a brief overview of what you're doing in this game. Uh, thematically, everybody is in control of a group of um, castell builders, essentially. It's apparently a competitive sport um, in, I believe, Spain, where people just climb on top of each other trying to make the tallest tower possible. Um, I'm sure there's other things going on, but uh, realistically, you want strong people down at the bottom, uh, also not, uh, strong but lightweight people in the middle, and lots of little lightweight people at the top to try and balance everybody. Now, this is a medium to slightly heavy uh, weight Euro game, which is not something you would expect for this theme. The theme is really cool, but in this game, you are actually trying to compete in a variety of different competitions across the map. You are also trying to increase your skills to actually build these towers. Now, at its heart, this is a puzzle-style game, really. Uh, you are going to be gaining the people who are actually building this human tower uh, as you play through the game, and they have different sizes, which means they can go into different spots on the pyramid. Now, at the start of the game, the rules for building a pyramid are such that you can't really win any awards with it. I'm not going to go into the specifics here, but um, you can make a weak little pyramid that's not really going to give you any points. Fortunately, as you play through the game and wander throughout the different locations, you can learn new skills, which lets you essentially break the rules of the game. Uh, normally, you can only have one uh, number worth of people on a row, but you could get a rule breaker that lets you have multiple people in that row. You could also get uh, another one that lets you, uh, instead of making a pyramid, you can make kind of a tower where you have even sides. Uh, there are a variety of different skills, which lets you break several of these things, like having uh, somebody hold somebody else on top, which is uh, the same number. I believe that's one of them, but it's that kind of thing. Now, what you are trying to do, actually, is as you play through the 10 rounds of the game, you want to, well, honestly do a lot of things, but the main thing is to build a really big, impressive tower, but also a tower that matches specific uh, patterns. Uh, now, there are a bunch of side shows that you can essentially compete in, and in order to take the tokens for those to get the victory points, the you have to match an exact uh, replica of a shape. And so that could have be a really tall, skinny tower. It could be a big, wide tower or a wide variety of different things in between. Now, also, as you are playing through the game, you are, of course, recruiting new people. And you never lose people throughout the game. So as you go through the game, you get more and more people who are resources to build this big tower. Now, in this game, you have to pay attention to a ton of different things. And one of the key things is that at the end of each of the 10 rounds, there are going to be one or maybe multiple performances. These performances happen in specific towns, and each performance is only uh, available to you if you have specific type of people in your overall pyramid. So you have to pay attention to where your pawn is out on the map, because every turn you can move this single pawn once or maybe a couple of times. So you have to make sure you're in the right spot to pick up the resources that you need from that location, maybe also some skills from that location, and you also want to end your turn in a location that has a competition that matches up with your skills that you can hopefully compete well in against your opponents. Uh, now, uh, at the end of the game, you're only going to score points for the best competition scoring that you did throughout the game, so you could um, just have no competitions except for once and do really well at that, or you could go throughout the game doing multiple competitions because you do get other points for competing in lots of things. Uh, now, there's a lot more going on to this game, but I think I'm going to talk 
uh, more about how it felt to play at this point instead of going into all the rules minutia. Uh, now, right from the get-go, I felt overwhelmed at the number of options and the amount of things to plan for in this game. Uh, you can see at the beginning of the game every single one of the performances for all 10 of the turns. You can see exactly where they are and what bonuses you, uh, you will get for specific types of people. You can also see out on the map and there's just a ton of different people that you can recruit in a bunch of different locations and the skills that you get uh, for visiting locations are associated with a spinning wheel and you can tell that, you know, in three turns, this is going to be over there because the wheel spins once per turn and you can plan according to that. Uh, what that means is this is a very strategic game and that's what I was a bit overwhelmed by. Uh, what I usually do in this situation is I just kind of cast the strategy aside and just try to do some cool stuff uh, and I think very tactically for at least, you know, the first third of a game or so and that's definitely what I did here with Castell. Uh, I was trying to focus on maybe getting a, uh, a performance done in a couple of turns while working towards a couple of the sideshows, but people are also, uh, your opponents are also trying to work towards those and all the time you are staring down at your uh, uh, people trying to build this pyramid as tall as you can while also trying to figure out how you can map things out. Now, like I said, at the core of this game, it feels like a puzzle because, again, you have these really basic rules, which I won't go into the specifics of, that let you build this puny little tower, but then you get those skill upgrades, which make the tower wider, potentially, or maybe taller, or hypothetically both, and you can do this in a wide variety of ways. So I spent probably 70 to 80% of my thinking power in this game staring down at my pyramid trying to figure out how I can best squeeze one more level out or uh, also looking uh, to the skill uh, wheel to figure out what one skill would essentially unlock the potential of the people that I already have um, because oftentimes you could have some people that don't really fit in with your uh, pyramid. Hopefully that's not the case, but you can definitely find yourself in that situation where suddenly you get one little rule-breaking skill that lets you fit everybody in and your tower gets even bigger. So fortunately, <laughs> when you're playing this game, you can be working on your tower at the same time as everybody else while you're thinking through a lot of other things. And I will say that this four-player game was not terribly short. Uh, I don't remember exactly how long it was, but it was certainly over two hours. And when the game was over, I found myself feeling like it was a little longer than I wanted, but after talking with my opponents about it, um, I realized that, uh, well, they had a good counterpoint to that, and that is that I was never really bored or waiting on somebody else to take their turn because I had so much to think about. So it was a bit of a long game because there was quite a bit to think about. So some people took long turns, but again, I wasn't sitting there bored feeling like I should, you know, surf the internet or something. I definitely felt like there's always something more that I can think about. Like I've got a good pyramid. I'm planning ahead towards that one sideshow. Oh wait, I also need to pay attention to where these specific uh, performances are going to be. Like I'm great for that performance, but I'm three spaces away from it. Can I get there in just one or two turns? Well, yeah, I probably can, but if I do that, then I'm giving up other actions, which would let me get some more rule breakers or get some more people. So every action has a uh, opportunity cost in this game, and you kind of want to do everything. And again, there's just so much to think about. So my uh, takeaway from this game, from this one play, is that I did enjoy it. It was a bit longer than I wanted, but I did enjoy, in particular, the puzzle of figuring out your pyramid. And I do think I would probably like it better at lower player counts, just to make it a little bit shorter of a game. Uh, but that being said, I would would certainly not mind playing it again, and I could see myself playing it at four players again as long as I went into it from the outset knowing this is going to be a two plus hour game because, again, there is so much to consider and so much to think about, which made for a pretty great puzzle overall, even though even at the uh, later stages of the game, I still felt a little bit overwhelmed with the number of different things I could do. So I found myself kind of doing the first really good thing, or I guess the, the best good thing that I could come up with in not a ludicrous amount of time. I always felt like if I gave myself more time to think through my turns. There was probably something better out there that I could have done, but I, of course, didn't want to upset my opponents by taking glacial turns. Uh, so yeah, that's Castell. I think it's a really neat game package because you have this uh, quite unique theme with a bunch of Yuri stuff going on, and figuring out that puzzle was really the highlight of the game. And again, I wouldn't mind trying it again in the future, but I'm not sure if this is going to be a game I push to play again. If somebody else brings it up and says they want to play, then I think it's likely I'll say yes. Okay, let's now move on to the second game I'll be discussing, and that one is Indigo. Now, this is also not a new game. In fact, this one came out in 2012. Uh, this is a Reiner Knizia design, and technically this is not an initial impression from me. In fact, this is the fifth time that I've played this game overall, and I have owned this game since about 2012, maybe 2013. I bought it uh, relatively soon after it came out. Uh, now, I realized 
I've never really discussed it on the Jungus Games channel, so I figure, well, let's talk about it now because I did uh, get a play in it of it um, just a couple of weeks ago. Now, uh, let's, as always, start with a brief overview of this game. Uh, now, the way it works is on your turn, you are going to have a single hexagon tile that you're going to add to a communal board, and all of these tiles have these little ribbony paths on them. Now, when you place these tiles down, that might cause these scoring stones in the on the table to move. Uh, they all start in the middle of the table, and whenever you add to a path that, that has a scoring stone on it, then it will move down that path until it runs into a dead end. Uh, now, these are neutral scoring stones, and the goal of the game is to try and work these stones to the edge of the board into your scoring area. Now, we played a two-player game of this, uh, myself and my wife, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and in a two-player game, you have um, essentially uh, sections of the overall board that just you score for, and other sections are just your opponent, so obviously you want to push the stones into your area. But if you play this with uh, three or four players, then you actually have some overlap zones. If you play a four-player game, which I have done in the past, um, you actually always overlap with somebody, which means it has this really interesting effect where you could push a stone out one side, which scores you a point, or, or some number of points, depending on the stone, and then you also give that same amount of points to your opponent that you share that zone with. So when you're not playing a two-player game, there is almost a semi-cooperative vibe to the game at times, where in order to score points for yourself, you are giving points to your opponents. So maybe you want to push the scoring stones into the area where you score, and somebody you think is doing poorly is going to score, as opposed to the person that you might be trying to catch up on, or if you think you're in the lead, uh, somebody who's chasing your tail. Now, um, in a two-player game, you don't have the zone uh, uh, overlap scoring, so to a certain extent, the game is a little bit simpler to think about, but it was still uh, uh, really fun to play. Uh, I say that like it's a surprise, and the reason I still have this game after owning it for seven to eight years is because every time I've thought about maybe culling it for my collection, I've thought, you know, I did always enjoy playing that game. I think I'm going to keep it a little bit longer. Uh, so I'm glad that I've kept it around. And I, again, got, got to play it at two players just a couple weeks ago and really enjoyed the experience. Now, the number one game that this uh, gets compared to is Suro. Uh, in Suro, you are placing down square tiles and you have one pawn that is yours. And you uh, place these tiles down and you once again move as far as you can. And I believe in that game, it's been a long time since I played, I believe you just want to be the last one standing. Uh, you want to be be the only person who did not fall off the edge of the map, essentially. Um, now, in Indigo, the pawns are not yours, and that's, I think, the reason why I like this game so much. They are neutral scoring stones, and they are just working their way all around this map as the game goes on, and you can actually build some pretty ridiculous ribbon strands. Uh, once you get late in the game, the board's going to get quite full, and you can find yourself placing down one tile that will then cause a stone to go over here and over there, and then score on the complete opposite side of the board. So you are constantly parsing the overall paths that these ribbons make. Um, now, some people aren't going to like that very much, but I love that part of the game, uh, seeing how all these paths are working out. And I also think it's beautiful. I think it's a really aesthetically pleasing uh, game to play as you build out this bigger and bigger map of all these uh, entangling different ribbons. Um, I, uh, as you're playing through the game, the scoring stones um, essentially get more lucrative. There's the one-pointers on the outside. In, in the middle, there are two-pointers, and eventually um, some three-point stones. I forget is it one or multiple? I think there might be just one three-point stone. Um, but essentially, as the game goes on, you might be a little bit behind, but you can definitely push back into the lead by, um, you know, grabbing that three-point stone or a couple of the two-pointers if um, your opponent lets you make that happen. Uh, so yeah, I I'm really glad I still own this game. That's part of the reason I wanted to talk about it here, because playing it again kind of reminded myself of the fun that I think is in this game, and also reinforced that this is potentially a forever game. Uh, it doesn't take up a huge amount of space on the shelf. It's a relatively thin box, and I just think it's wonderful. It's got a really easy uh, rule set to play. I've almost taught the whole game at this point, um, and I, every time I've played it with people, um, there's just a joy that comes in for me and also for other people in seeing how all these things fly around. It's also not a terribly long game. It takes 30 to 45 minutes or so to play. So uh, I still think that Indigo is great, and I heartily recommend people giving this one a try, especially if they've played other games like Suro and thought that was fine, but um, maybe didn't like the player elimination there. Well, there's no player elimination in this game. You just have some wonderful uh, ribbon uh, sailing around with the neutral stones in the middle. All right, we can now move on to the third game I'll be talking about today, and that one is Paladins of the West Kingdom. Now, this is a game that came out 
relatively recently, I think within the last year or so. And this is a game in a growing line of games from the same publisher that have similar art and some slightly similar, uh, I guess, icons and maybe mechanics. Uh, in Paladins of the West Kingdom, you are uh, doing a bunch of worker placement. Uh, in other games like Architects of the West Kingdom, you have worker placement that works differently. And in Viscounts of the West Kingdom, which I've talked about previously, you've got a crazy Rondell thing. But today I'm talking about Paladins. Now, I actually played this one because I wanted to get familiar with how it plays so that I'd be ready to film a uh, tutorial of the game, and that should have come out by the time I've put this Impressions vlog up. Uh, it seemed like there was quite a bit going on, so I wanted to have a full play under my belt to feel more confident about teaching it, and I am glad I got to do that. Uh, now, I played this one on Tabletop Simulator, and I played it with three friends, so it was a full complement of four, and let's start off by covering the base mechanics of the game. Uh, now, this is a worker placement game at its heart but you use neutral workers. Um, so at the start of each one of the seven rounds of the game, you are going to draw three random paladin cards from the top of your deck. Everyone has an identical deck that you shuffle up, so you see uh, different cards, but the same set as you play through the game. Now, you have these three cards, and you will only use one in that given round. You will take another one and put it on top of your deck, so you'll draw it in the next round, and the other one will go to the bottom of the deck. So, depending on what time in the game it is, you might see that card again, or you might not. Um, now, the Paladin that you choose is going to give you a slight rule breaker for the round, uh, usually some sort of efficiency, but in addition to that, it will also give you two workers that you get to use for that round. Now, there are are a variety of different colored workers in the game, and in addition to those two that you get from the Paladin, you will then also select four more from a variety of cards in the middle of the table. Uh, you take them from the cards in turn order, so that means if you're close to the front of turn order, you get more options, and if you're near the back, then you will have less options, but you will always be getting six workers each round, and the color will vary. Uh, now, once you do all that, you'll just go into the main part of the game where, uh, on your turn, you are going to do one action, and that can uh, take one or maybe even more multiple workers. Uh, for the most part, you're going to be putting these workers down onto your own personal board, and there are a ton of different actions. Uh, some of the slots have a uh, kind of transparent outline, which means you can put any worker there, and many of them have a specific color, which matches a specific type of worker. Now, I'm not going to go into all of these different actions, but I will say that a big part of this game is making sure that you have the right workers to match up with these colors, and once everybody has done all the actions they want to, the round will be over, and you will remove all of the workers that were used, so you will start the next round off with a clean slate again. Now, fortunately, as you're playing through the game, one of the actions lets you develop. Now, that lets you put these little house tokens down onto some of your actions, which will lower the number of workers that it takes to actually execute that action. Uh, that's important because those um, six special actions on the right side of your board normally cost three workers. Uh, remember, at the start of each round, you are going to be getting six workers, so that is hypothetically half of your overall worker uh, amount to execute just one action versus some of the other actions that cost one or two. So you can actually make those specialized actions cheaper. Uh, you can put a couple of these down and make them only take one worker instead of three, which is a pretty big deal. Now, once again, not going into all of the specifics of that stuff, um, at the heart of this game, you are trying to pull off combos, and these combos will kind of let you keep going throughout rounds. Uh, there are many things that you will do in this game that will give you more workers. So you might start the round off with six workers, but you will use an action that maybe takes two workers, and you get to do a thing, which will actually give you another worker back. Uh, and you can also save up to three workers uh, at the end of a round. So you could start off the next round with three people already, then get six more, so now you're at nine, and then you do some more actions in order to get more workers as you're trying to work your way through all these things. Um, now, obviously, taking actions is good, but workers actually block the spots, so it's possible that you could get more workers than you necessarily need, uh, and you oftentimes have a choice. Do you want to get more workers, or maybe do you want some provisions or coins, which are resources um, that you will use to do a wide variety of these things? Uh, now, one big thing that you're uh, also trying to keep in mind is the fact that you can get cards that are townsfolk, which will give you bonuses when you do specific action types. So you can try to build towards kind of an engine. If you get multiple townsfolk for a specific action, then when you do that action, you do even more stuff for it. And of course, there's the other efficiency that I already talked about of doing developments so that you can do the powerful actions on your board with less people. Uh, now, in our four-player game, I essentially 
uh, ignored the townsfolk <laughs> entirely. You start the game with one of them, uh, and I actually got one that gave me a rebate for doing a develop action, which again lets it uh, lets you spend less workers for some of the actions. And so I spent the whole game trying to get the development done as much as I could, and I never got townsfolk. So I ignored that efficiency while trying to focus on action efficiency to make the strong actions uh, cost less people, which did seem good. Uh, I'm not sure if that was necessarily a good idea, but one prevalent uh, thing in this game is the fact that you can not do everything, and there is so much that you can do. Uh, on your board, there are those six special actions, and um, each one of them has a threshold of a uh, type of thing that you have to be at. That could be faith, it could be strength, and it could also be uh, influence. And each one of those also bumps one of the other types. So if you uh, want to do the commission action to place some monks out, you are going to need faith to do that. And then that will actually give you influence, which moves you up the track. And you might need the influence in order to do the fort, um, fortitude, I believe, action, which lets you build out walls, which can give you bonuses. And that will give you strength, which will give you the ability to do the attack action. So without going into more specifics of those special actions on your board, um, they have a bit of a cyclical thing going to them where you could uh, really go hard on one of them, which kind of lets you have the stuff that you need to go hard on another one. And again, you want to try and do everything, but there's no way to actually pull all of this stuff off. Um, now, uh, also, as you're playing through the game, you're going to do seven rounds overall. And as you go through the first three rounds, there are going to be end game conditional uh, scoring options that show up that are different each game. But then there will also be, I believe it was four different kind of uh, communal action spaces in the middle of the board. Uh, they are hidden at the start of the game. And once you hit, I believe the third round, you'll start to see these pop up and you can send workers over there to do the actions on them. Those are generally uh, pretty powerful actions and it's the only time that you actually spend your workers not on your own player board. And I think it's now time to delve a little bit more into my thoughts on how the play went. Uh, and I guess I'll just start with something that I didn't like about the game. Uh, I will say that I enjoyed the game overall, but I happen to be here. So let's talk more about those neutral actions in the middle of the board. Um, again, they're face down at the start, so you don't know what they will be. And when you reveal them, the starting player, which is going to change each round, is uh, going to have first dibs at placing onto those spots. And the actions on those can really vary. So right from the get-go in this um, somewhat heavy uh, Euro game, there is a decent splash of randomness there where the card that flips might be really good for the starting player or it might not really work for what they're trying to do. More often than not, it seemed like they were very good uh, and um, those actions got taken uh, usually before anything else did. Uh, and there were a couple of times in our game where the card flipped over and everyone but the starting player groaned because the starting player is like, that is a great action. Uh, now, of course, as you go farther into the game, there are more of these. So if the starting player goes after that great one and everybody liked another one that was revealed another round uh, in a previous round, then obviously somebody can go over and take that as well. But the biggest problem I actually have with that uh, central uh, row there is that people would just easily forget that it was an option. Uh, you spend most of the game placing workers on your own player board area, and then suddenly there's this thing out there halfway through the game that pops up that you can use, and it's just so easy to forget. Um, honestly, I, I kind of wish that instead of being uh, neutral worker placement spots, those were just bonuses. Uh, you flip the card over, and now everybody gets a uh, coin, or now everybody gets a free red worker, or something like that. Um, obviously, that would be a big difference to the way the game mechanically works, but it would be kind of a fun bonus for everybody instead of just being a fun bonus for certain people, depending on what the uh, the current uh, turn order is looking like. And it would make the game more elegant because all the worker placement would happen in front of you instead of some of it happening out there. Uh, now, that's a gripe that I have with the game. That's uh, part of the game that I did not like. So now let's talk about why I actually enjoyed the game. <laughs> I started this off one on the negative. I uh, didn't really mean to do that. Um, I really liked the puzzling nature of uh, figuring out how you're going to use the resources that you have, in this case, uh, by resources, I mean the workers, to figure out, uh, to get through your round. You, you will have goals that you want to get to, and you're going to need this color worker there. You need a red and then a black for that. You'll need two blues to do this and maybe another black to do that. Um, there are many ways to clear workers off of actions so that in the middle of the round, you can then do that action again. One of them is on your player board, but there are also a bunch of other bonuses that let you do that. So you're also trying to plan for that. 
you might want to do uh, one powerful action multiple times because you have some townsfolk for them, uh, or maybe it's just a really efficient action because you have developed it a couple of times. And you can do that and maybe clear it out by taking a bonus from doing this other thing to then do it again and then do the prey action to clear it off and maybe even do it a third time on your turn uh, in that given round. And that is certainly fun. So you are spending a lot of time trying to figure out if you can pull off these cool combos. And when you do pull off a really good combo in a round, it does feel great. The problem is that there is a lot to think about. And we played a four player game. It was a first play for two of us and a uh, not the first play for the other two people. And it took four hours to play this. Uh, now, this was on Tabletop Simulator. So playing online um, in a virtual space does make it a little bit slower, uh, but that does not include a teach. We all learned the rules separately and started the game. And four hours later, it was done. And we all enjoyed it, but I think all of us were feeling like it was easily an hour longer than we wanted it to be. Um, I think that's mostly because it was a four-player game. It doesn't seem like there's anything that affects the overall length of the game based off of player count. Uh, at lower player counts, there are uh, less spots that you can activate in the middle of the table, and it kind of affects this Inquisition mechanic, which I haven't really talked about, and it's probably not worth really going into. Um, so with more players, the game is just going to take longer. And my takeaway from it is that I really enjoyed puzzling through what I wanted to do on a turn, uh, especially when you consider that um, at the start of the turn, you're figuring out which paladin you want to go with. So that's going to give you two workers, and those worker colors are really important. That paladin will also give you a bonus for the entire round that you will probably want to uh, try to exploit. And then you have to decide which of these available uh, worker cards is the one that gives you the mix of workers that will let you actually pull off your plan. So before people even take their first turn, there were uh, times where somebody would just sit there for a couple of minutes just, they kept saying, you know, just give me one more second, uh, just give me, you know, 30 more seconds, as they felt like they were just right there, they're just one thing away from confirming they could pull off this really wonderful round, but they want to just think it through because they would hate to be one coin shy or one worker shy, and that takes time. So while I enjoyed uh, crunching through all of that, it left me feeling like this would probably be a much better game at lower player counts. Uh, there's not actually that much, uh, interaction with other players in the game. Uh, you do have those neutral worker placement spots in the middle, so that is some interaction. And the townsfolk cards that you take, well, if you take them, then obviously no one else can grab them. And there are these outsiders that you can attack or recruit for some endgame points. So you do have some interaction there with uh, depleting those resources or those options away from your opponents. But I feel like this would be best at a two player count. Um, it will be obviously the quickest overall. Uh, you will have just about the same amount of stuff to consider. Uh, you'll have less uh, situations where somebody takes something that you desperately wanted that was maybe key to your overall plan, but you couldn't quite get there yet. Maybe you had to do it as your third action and somebody grabs that card uh, right before you can and suddenly, well, your whole round got a bit upended. Maybe your uh, uh, your strategy was a bit fragile and now you have to sit there thinking for minutes trying to figure out how to salvage the round to figure other things out. Um, I will mention that uh, with so many different things going on and especially so many actions that require you to be at certain points with other actions, we did have a moment in this game where one of the players um, just kind of forgot that they actually needed a threshold of a specific type of thing to do these actions. They got so uh, wound up with this awesome round that they had planned out in order to do this, to clear this thing out, to do that, to get this bonus, which lets them do this, um, that it wasn't until we were about three quarters of the way through that round when one of the other people realized, oh, wait a second, you don't have enough influence to do like two or three of the actions that you have already done. Uh, we were also focused on our own puzzles that we did not notice um, that this other person had just kind of blanked on this one aspect of the overall strategy and everything they had done in that round kind of fell apart. Uh, because of that, we actually spent about 15 minutes um, pulling their round apart so that they could kind of redo that round so that it, we were kind of not cheating. And that did increase the play length to a certain extent, but it's a mistake that I could easily have seen myself doing. Um, there is good iconography in the game, but with so much to consider, um, you could potentially miss something that uh, is crucial, but is just kind of lost in the weeds of all of the other things that you are thinking about. So um, at the end of the day, I don't think I see myself ever playing Paladins of the West Kingdom at four players. Um, I think I could be talked into playing it at three players if both of the other people have played the game before, but I think this game is probably best at two players, and honestly, I wouldn't mind playing it again, uh, specifically at the two-player count, to explore some other things. Uh, as I mentioned before, I didn't really go into the recruiting aspect of the game at all, so I wasn't getting uh, those townsfolk bonuses, which seemed really fun. I was focusing on other things, and in this game, it seems like you are just going to have to 
essentially ignore at least 30% of the things that you could do to focus on the other things. Uh, maybe you should actually ignore more to be really hyper efficient on uh, other specific actions. I've only played it once, so I'm not sure how to play it best, but um, there's definitely some replayability there um, with just wanting to explore other parts of the game that uh, you might have ignored. <laughs> In the game we played last night, I essentially uh, didn't recruit and I never did the absolve action. And there's a bunch of really cool stuff that you could do with the absolve action that I obviously haven't gone into details with here. Uh, so yeah, that is my initial impression of Paladins of the West Kingdom. Hopefully I get to try it at two players at some point in the future because um, <laughs> realistically, even though there's so much going on, each individual rule is very straightforward, uh, certainly much more straightforward than uh, Viscounts of the West Kingdom and I think Architects as well. I think Paladins is actually the most straightforward and uh, elegant of each of, uh, of all of those options so far. Um, just the issue with it is that it played way too long. There's just a little bit too much to talk about. So I think I'm talking in circles and that's going to wrap up my thoughts on Paladins. This means we've reached the fourth and final game I'll be talking about today, and that one is Pictures. Now, this game actually won the Spiel des Jahres this year. Uh, I actually got a press copy of this one from Rio Grande Games about a week after the Shelter in Place thing happened for the pandemic, and Pictures is a two to five player game. Uh, what that means is, it took months until I could actually play this one. Uh, when it first arrived, I had never even heard of it before. I was like, that looks like a funky game. And then I wasn't able to play it because it's a three player minimum. And again, just the two of us in the house. And like a month or two later, it won the Spiel des Jahres. And I was like, wow, I really need to play this game that is sitting on my shelf. Um, again, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, that was very hard to do. Uh, but fortunately, um, just last week, uh, we were able to go on a social distance uh, camping vacation with a couple of our friends. Uh, so we spent several days outside and we did play some games with masks on. Um, again, outside at a picnic table, uh, and this is one of the games that we got to play. Uh, so we played this one at four players, and uh, what this game is, is a competitive game where you are trying to use various um, uh, tokens and things to try and get your competitors to figure out what you are trying to say. In the middle of the table, you are going to deal out 16 of these pictures, which have a wide variety of stuff on them, and then in each one of the five rounds in the game, everyone is going to simultaneously going to try and, um, I guess, illustrate the picture that they have randomly chosen. You pull a token out of the bag and it might say B2 and you look B2, that's the card and the picture that you're trying to illustrate. Now I say illustrate because you are going to be doing this with one of five different sets of resources. Uh, they each have their own rule set, but they're pretty straightforward. Uh, one of them is a set of, um, I think, think it was three sticks and four little stones, or maybe it's uh, three stones and four sticks. Another set is just two shoestrings that you can lay out and kind of uh, splay however which way you want. Another set is a series of cards with icons on them that you can play out that might be associated with the picture you're going for. Uh, there's another one which I really liked where you have to build a three by three grid of colored cubes. Um, you have to uh, put nine cubes down from a wide variety of these and of course you're trying to pay, make a three by three grid that is most similar to the picture that you are going for. There are a couple others, but that should give you a, re a reasonable idea of the types of stuff that you're doing. And everybody is going to be using their set of stuff uh, individually and simultaneously. And then once you're done, you'll look out at each one of your competitors and try to figure out which one of the pictures they were trying to illustrate. So this is a competitive game where you are not trying to dupe your opponents. You actually want them to figure out what you are illustrating because once everybody has written their uh, guesses in secret, we will then go around the table. And for instance, for me, um, I'll ask, what did everybody think mine was? That person might say B1, that person says C2, and that one says B1. I flip over the token, it says B1, and that means everyone who guessed B1 correctly is going to get a point, and I will get one point for everyone who guessed correctly. So each of my opponents gets a point, and I get two points because two opponents guessed it. So we go around the table doing that for everybody, and then you're going to pass your resources once to the right. So you might have been building out that three by three grid with the cubes uh, in this round, and now you pass that over, and now you have this um, massive pile of wooden blocks that you're going to use to illustrate the next one. Now I did say that you're going to play through five rounds, and that that there are five different sets of resources, and that's intentional. Every time you play pictures, you are going to be uh, using each of the five sets of resources once, and you kind of go in a procession, and once you go through five rounds, the person with the most points wins. Uh, now, this is a very aesthetically catching game. Uh, right off the bat, if you see some people playing this game, you will probably say, 
why are there stones and sticks in that game? Like literally rocks is part of the uh, uh, materials that come with this game. Uh, one person is playing around with stones and sticks. Another person is uh, messing around with colored cubes. And that person over there is trying to gingerly lay shoelaces down in a specific pattern to again, try to match one of these pictures. Uh, so that is eye-catching, obviously, and also somewhat unique. <laughs> I can't think of uh, games, uh, other games that use a variety of uh, mechanics like that, or I guess uh, components like that. Uh, now, I think we all quite enjoyed the game. Uh, I certainly did. I feel like uh, playing it at five players would also be fun, just having one more person to try and guess, and so that every one of the different types of materials are used each round. Uh, in a four-player game, one of the sets is not used in each round. Uh, now, we played just one game of this, and it probably took about 30 minutes or so, uh, and it was a really pleasant experience overall. Uh, this is a game that I can certainly see myself keeping, uh, in particular for uh, playing with family, uh, you know, in a future where uh, we might go to family gatherings for Christmas and Thanksgiving and that kind of thing. I could certainly see myself playing this one uh, with people um, in my family who don't play games very often because the rules overhead for this is very low. Um, you pretty much say, pull a uh, token out of the bag. It has a, it tells you what picture you're going for. Try to make that picture as best as you can with this pile of random stuff. And then uh, you just go for it. So I think the rules complexity is a big win. Um, I'm not really sure if I uh, feel strongly that this game should have won the Spiel des Jahres. That did seem a little bit uh, unusual, but the game itself is unusual, and I think that's probably one of the big uh, pulling aspects to it, is the fact that this feels maybe a little bit familiar to some other games. Uh, a game like Imagine is one that comes to mind. That's a cooperative game where you are putting down these transparent uh, cards that have various icons on them, trying to get people to guess a specific thing. Uh, also Concept, which is just a great distillation of the genre, and I think also won the Spiel des Jahres. It was certainly nominated. I can't remember exactly, but um, it does seem like the Spiel des Jahres uh, in general enjoys this kind of, or I guess the judging committee does like this type of game uh, because obviously this one won. Uh, so yeah, I'm definitely keeping pictures around. I could certainly see myself playing this in the future. Um, it's a bummer it doesn't work at two players because that's the majority of the gaming uh, that I'm doing right now in person, but I could definitely see a future where we play this with more people, maybe up to five players with the family. I think that player count is also great for uh, family gatherings where there's a bunch of people who might want to play a relatively quick game uh, before moving on to another game or just something else. So yeah, I am impressed with pictures. I'm glad that uh, Rio Grande sent me a press copy of this one, <laughs> and I imagine I'll be keeping this one for a while. Well, that is going to bring us to the end of this impressions vlog. Um, I have technically played Mariposas and um, sort of played Fort, but I don't want to cover those just yet. Um, I only played Mariposas at two, and I'm going to try to play that with more people before I give my impressions of it. And I played Fort incorrectly, like very wrong. So I need to get around to playing that one again with the correct rules. So hopefully I will be giving my impressions of those soon. And I'm also in the middle of a Rise of Queensdale campaign. I think we are four games into that one. And and um, I'll obviously talk about my impressions of that, uh, certainly once the campaign is over or potentially in the middle. I'm not sure. But um, either way, um, I hope you've enjoyed this vlog. I noticed that it's been two months since I put one of these impressions vlogs out. And um, hypothetically, I will be putting more of them out in the future uh, and not waiting two more months until you see more of this. Uh, so yeah, I think that's going to bring this vlog to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you would like to directly support the channel and the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongusgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.